from the Pope John Paul II Cultural Center in Washington, D.C., Raymond Arroyo. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to the World Over Live. We've got a fantastic show for you tonight. As a Christian is beheaded in Somalia and China finances the regime in Sudan, the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, which tracks religious freedom around the world for the U.S. government, is facing extinction in Congress. To discuss it, we'll be joined by the man who proposed the bill that created the Religious Freedom Commission, Congressman Frank Wolf of Virginia, a tireless human rights and religious rights advocate. He'll also discuss his new memoir, Prisoner of Conscience. And later, he's one of our greatest novelists, author Ron Hansen is here. He comes back to discuss his searing work, how his faith shapes that work, and his two most recent novels, A Wild Surge of Guilty Passion and Exiles. So get your questions ready. We'll take as many as possible. Give us a ring, 1-800-221-9460 in the U.S. and internationally, 205-271-2980. Or drop us an email at worldover at EWTN. Dot com. Let's get started. Here's the brief news from the world over this week. Bishop Robert Finn and his Diocese of Kansas City, St. Joseph, were indicted this past week on a misdemeanor charge for failure to report child abuse. This after the diocese waited five months to inform civil authorities about hundreds of images of children, many pornographic, discovered on a priest's computer. Bishop Finn and the diocese have been cooperating with civil authorities in the investigation, and the bishop has previously apologized for his handling of the matter. The indictment is the first for a U.S. bishop related to clerical abuse. Bishop Finn and the diocese have pled not guilty to all charges. The bishop faces a maximum penalty of one year in jail and a $1,000 fine if convicted of the misdemeanor. And in Egypt, the country's top reform leader offered his condolences to the Coptic community after more than 20 of its members were killed during a Cairo protest two weeks ago. Mohammed El Baradi on Sunday called for an independent investigation into the deaths. Many of the victims were killed when armored military vehicles sped through the crowds of protesters. Others were shot. Meanwhile, the head of the Coptic Catholic Church, Cardinal Antonius Naguib, called on government officials to bring security and safety to Egypt. He's hopeful that the transitional government will ensure the, quote, well-being and dignity of all its citizens, end quote. And in Sudan, President and Strongman Omar al-Bashir said the overwhelmingly Muslim nation will soon adopt Sharia law. In a speech to students in Khartoum this past week, al-Bashir said Sudan's official religion will be Islam and Islamic law the main source. 98% of the people are Muslim, and the new constitution will reflect this, he said. Sudan's current constitution provides for freedom of religion, at least in theory, recognizing that Sudan is, quote, multi-religious. Al-Bashir continues to face an indictment in the International Criminal Court for Crimes Against Humanity in Darfur. More on religious freedom and human rights around the world in our next segment. And a major ruling out of the EU European Court of Justice this week. The High Court of the European Union ruled that patents cannot be granted for military research involving the destruction, medical research rather, involving the destruction of human embryos. The patent ban effectively removes any and all financial incentives for embryonic stem cell research in EU member nations. According to the decision, the deliberate destruction of human embryos is, quote, contrary to morality. EU law prohibits patents for interventions based on immoral practices. In reaching the decision, the court found that a human embryo is a developing human being and therefore has certain rights. And the spin-offs of the Occupy Wall Street protests in Europe have erupted into violent, uh, violence at times, while protests in Rome turned sacrilegious this past weekend. 
Amateur video captured the moment when a hoodlum ransacked a church and stomped on a statue of Our Lady of Fatima. A large crucifix from Saints Marcelino and Peter Church was also destroyed. Occupy Rome organizers plan to march from a city center square to the Basilica of St. John Lateran. But groups of young people soon began vandalizing, looting stores, setting cars on fire, and clashing with police. Vatican spokesman Father Federico Lombardi said the mob violence that took place during the unrest or protests in Rome was unacceptable and unjustifiable. And activist and acclaimed Hollywood actress Susan Sarandon has come under fire for calling Pope Benedict XVI a Nazi. Sarandon made the remark during a public discussion at a film festival this past weekend when she made reference to the movie Dead Man Walking, in which she played Sister Helen Prejean. Now, Sarandon told an audience in the Hamptons that she'd sent a copy of Sister Prejean's anti-capital punishment book to the Pope, clarifying, she said, the last one, not this Nazi one we have now. The discussion moderator attempted to blunt the comment, but Sarandon repeated the epithet. Both the Catholic League and the Anti-Defamation League denounced Sarandon and called for an apology. Bill Donahue of the Catholic League said her ignorance is willful. Those who have hatred in their veins are not interested in the truth. And Abram Foxman of the ADL said her remarks were deeply disturbing, offensive, and completely uncalled for, an attack on the good name of Pope Benedict XVI. And Pope Benedict is perhaps slowing, or showing rather, the signs of age, at least physically. On Sunday, the Holy Father, for the first time, used a rolling platform to make his way down the center aisle of St. Peter's Basilica for Mass. A spokesman said that the platform, the same device that was used by Blessed John Paul II in his later years, is being used to alleviate the efforts of the Holy Father and not because of any particular medical problem. The use of the platform in St. Peter's Basilica is saving the Holy Father a walk of more than 100 yards while wearing those heavy vestments. I mean, at age 84, I don't see what the big deal is. I could use one of those platforms to get on and off this set, I think, most days. Up next, Virginia Congressman Frank Wolf is here to talk about the threats to religious freedom around the world. And Ron Hansen is straight ahead. We'll take your calls when the World Over Live continues. Stay right there. Once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to the World Over Live. My first guest has been a tireless champion of human rights and religious freedom all over the world. A Virginia congressman for more than 30 years, he's witnessed some of the worst horrors of the modern world. From the Ceausescu regime in Romania, humanitarian disasters in Ethiopia and Darfur, as well as China's ongoing disregard for human rights, he's the author of a new memoir, Prisoner of Conscience, One Man's Crusade for Global, Human, and Religious Rights. Please welcome Congressman Frank Wolf. Great to see you, Congressman. Thank and, you. And my congressman, I should say, oh, right oh, up front. Good. So uh, well, I'm right good. there in yeah. your district. Oh, so good. let's start with, uh, we're seeing today, we heard of, of uh, uh, Muammar Gaddafi's death in uh, Libya. This Arab Spring seems to be creating more instability than, than uh, a flourishing of freedom. Your thoughts on this and what this portends for human rights and religious rights throughout the Middle East? Well, I, I don't know. I'm concerned. I was in Egypt a couple mm -hmm. months ago. I was there in July. I met with the Coptic Christian community, and they're afraid. Mm -hmm. They are afraid. And I also met with the Muslim Brotherhood, and I talked to different people, and there is real concern that the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafis may very well win the next mm -hmm. election. And then we saw last week, as you know, 20 some Coptic Christians were, yep. were killed. And so uh, in Egypt, it could be, it could be bad. Uh, in other places, uh, Tunisia, probably good. Libya, we hope good, although weapons could be mm -hmm. pouring out to places. But uh, I think for it to be good, the American, the president and the Congress have to really act and speak out mm -hmm. and stand on the side of the persecuted. The Coptic Christians there, are baffled. They say, you've given our country over $50 billion, and yet nobody will advocate for us. So 
I think it's a mixed bag. When you, uh, you, you said you were recently in Egypt, and as you travel throughout this region, you know, as a, as a practicing Christian, I know you've got a small prayer group on the hill you've had for years and led for years. When you look and realize this is the cradle of Christianity in the world, when you're talking about the Copts, when you're talking about uh, Christians I- around the Holy Land uh, in Jordan, uh, what, what, what is your thought? What is your concern? Do you think we're going to lose this, this living Christian tradition well, in the Middle East? I, I worry about that. We just had a bill passed in the uh, House, which is blocked in the Senate. We mm-hmm. hope that it passes tonight or tomorrow to set up a special envoy in the State Department to advocate for Christians and other religious minorities in, in the Middle East. But you have uh, the uh, uh, Shabazz Bhatti, who was Catholic, who was gunned down mm-hmm. in Pakistan. You have the woman Bibi, who's in prison in Pakistan. Look at all the money we have, we've given there. Right. The Coptic Christians are going through a very difficult time. And the Assyrian Chaldean Catholic Church in Iraq is under greater pressure. Yeah. More biblical activity took place in Iraq than any other country other than Israel. Abraham yep. was from Ur. I, I was in Nasiriya, which is now the uh, era, I went to the location, they said where, where Abraham's house was. Uh, you have Daniel's buried in Kirkuk, Esther. And uh, the Assyrian Chaldean Christians are being slaughtered. You had 56 killed in the church last uh, year. Mm-hmm. About half of them have been forced out, pushed mm-hmm. into Jordan, uh, Damascus, uh, uh, Syria. And I really worry, and that's why I believe the church in the West Mm-hmm. has to become much more open and aggressive to advocate mm-hmm. for the Christians in the Middle East. Otherwise, we're going to empty the Middle East out. And if we lose the Christianity in the Middle mm-hmm. East, it'll, it'll Con- be bad. Congressman Wolf, you were instrumental in 1998 creating something called the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. This is a watchdog group of experts and activists who really traverse the world watching and rating religious freedom and human rights around the world. They report both to Congress and to the State Department. Correct. Now, they are in very huge danger right now of not being funded. This could be the end of this commission. What does the commission do and why is it not, why is Congress not allowing this group that's done so much good to continue? Well, the commission bill passed the House uh-huh. overwhelmingly. It's now in the Senate. Uh, the, what the commission does, it, it's bipartisan, nonpartisan, mm-hmm. looks at the persecuting the church in the, uh, the Catholic church in Ch- China is being persecuted. We look mm-hmm. at different, they look at uh, the Baha'is that are being persecuted in, in Egypt. Why it would be controversial, I'm not sure. One senator, one senator, the Senate has strange uh, laws mm-hmm. and rules. One senator is blocking it. Anonymously. Anonymously. They mm-hmm. have what they call these secret holds. Mm-hmm. And... For some reason, we just can't get it passed. And I would think that senator uh, would say, well, look at what's taking place with regard to the Coptic Christians. Look what's taking place. But one senator. So I would urge your listeners to call their senators uh, and ask them to move this bill quickly. Senator Kerry, the chairman of the committee, is for the bill. John Kerry's for John the bill. John Kerry's yeah. for the bill. Dick Luger, the ranking Republican, mm-hmm. is for the bill. But that one senator has stopped it, and he stopped it for about, it's been over three weeks. Hmm. Uh, there, there's an extension until November, and after November, that would be it. If after this bill November 18th, this commission could go out of uh, business. Is the administration supportive of the measure as well? Uh, will the, the administration has been silent. Uh, the, 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 the president will sign it, but this administration doesn't necessarily like the, the, the commission. Uh, the mm-hmm. Clinton administration didn't like the commission. Uh, mm-hmm. But I think clearly if it passes, it passed the House overwhelmingly, mm-hmm. will pass the Senate overwhelmingly, uh, I think the president will sign it. Now, you discovered and you reveal in the book, uh, Prisoner of Conscience, the uh, complicity between the Chinese government and what we've been seeing over the last few years in Sudan. Right. They've actually been providing aid and assistance. They Tell have. us about that. Uh, Sam Brownback and I, uh, Sam was the senator, he's mm-hmm. now a, a governor in Kansas. We were the first two to go to Darf- Darfur. Mm-hmm. In Darfur, where there is genocide, the Chinese are aiding them. The Antonov bombers that fly over the bomb coming from support. And from, they're bombing uh, their own China. people. Bombing we their say. own people. Yeah. This uh, is Christian the, and animist populations right. there. The in Soviet Hind helicopters come in and coming from Chinese to support. China just welcomed several months ago. President Bashir, Bashir invited 
Osama bin Laden. Bin Laden lived in Sudan from 91 to 95. Bashir <laughs> is an indicted war criminal. Okay. President Hu Jintao, who's cracking down on the church in China, gave right. him a red carpet welcome. <laughs> He's been indicted by the criminal court. And just the other day, the governor of Malawi <laughs> invited Bashir to come in, gave him a red carpet treatment, and we in the United States are giving Malawi a Millennium Challenge grant of several hundred million dollars and in the administration, the budget is over $200 million for him, and nobody's saying anything. Bashir has been responsible for the death of hundreds of thousands of people, and the number one supporter of Bashir is China, and the largest embassy in Khartoum is the Chinese hmm. government. Is the financial situation and the fact that China is in large part America's landholder or, or landlord uh, because of the money being loaned, is that in any way restricting America's moral voice on these human rights and religious rights around the world? I think it is. China is our banker. Mm -hmm. China is our banker in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, which funds radical Wahhabism, which mm -hmm. created those madrasas on the Afghan-Pakistan border, and China, China spying against us, stealing secrets, has cyber attacks against most major companies. The Chinese are, are persecuting the Catholic Church. The Bishop of Hong Kong was in to see me. He was in to see Chris Smith and right. me uh, three, three months ago, mm -hmm. said what's taking place. The Karnal Kung Foundation will tell you there are a number of Catholic bishops under house arrest. Protestant pastors are being arrested. They have plundered to Tibet, and yet they have us. They're our banker, and they're... It's, it's like your banker, your personal yeah. banker. He's would, holding would your be, loan. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, so, it, so it stifles the, the it voice. It stifles it. And not only, you remember the song by Simon and Garfunkel, the boxer, it said, man hears what he wants to hear mm -hmm. and disregards the rest. We're disregarding yeah. that. And this administration is mm -hmm. disregarding. They will not speak out. When President Obama, the 2009 mm -hmm. Nobel Prize winner, put on a dinner for Hu Xintao, the president of China, mm -hmm. the 2010 Nobel Prize winner, Zhao Bo, was in prison and under house arrest. China is doing bad, bad things and yeah. stealing our jobs. It's unbelievable. Uh, a recent Pew study found that nearly 70% of the world's population lives in countries with high restrictions on religious freedom. Who will speak out on these issues? If the International Com or if, if the U.S. Commission on Religious Freedom ceases to exist, and if you can't get a bill with some advocate to raise a voice in the United States on behalf of these populations? Well, it would be up to the administration. And if uh, uh, they have not spoken out, if you recall when the Coptic Christians were killed last week, mm -hmm. the president, the press secretary, Carney, was very, very weak. Uh, they mm -hmm. have not spoken out about the persecuted of the church. Uh, they have not spoke. I, I don't know. Uh, and if you watch the last presidential debates, none of the questions coming from the media have been on human rights and religious freedom. No. Not one. No. Not no. one. Well, they're so, too busy worried about, you know, 999 plans yeah, and these other yeah. side issues. Who's up? Who's down? But, Who yeah, likes man this does guy? not live by bread alone. I agree. And, uh, I agree. Uh, and the president is he, part of his the important part of his job as commander in chief is engaging the rest of the world and leading the rest of the world. But when you lose the economic power, you're on the Appropriations Committee as well. When when America loses its economic power, it also loses its moral it, standing in the it, world as well, it, it, its ability to influence other it countries. Does. It, it does. And if you recall, in 1956, the British and French invaded the Suez Canal. Mm -hmm. President Eisenhower told them to get out. They refused. Eisenhower said, dump their paper. We began to dump their paper. They got out, and they were never again a great country. When you lose your economic ability, and that's why another issue, but we've got to control this debt Mm -hmm. and deficit and deal with it. Uh, we, we just recently heard this week of a 17-year-old Christian boy beheaded in Somalia uh, by Muslim extremists. We are seeing this, um, the outbreak, if you will, of this radical form of Islam. We are. How do we deal with this? Well, first of all, I think the church, one, I think the government has to speak at, our mm -hmm. government, our president, our, our Congress, the Religious Freedom Commission. Mm -hmm. But the church in the West really needs to speak out more. There used to be almost, most churches on a Sunday, one Sunday a, month, a year had a religious freedom Sunday. The church needs to advocate, and that's what confuses the Christian in the Middle East. They say, why isn't the church in the West speaking out for us? And mm -hmm. I think until that time, mm -hmm. bad things. Nothing's going to happen. Let's go to the phones. Joe from New York. What's your question, Joe? 
Hi, Raymond. Good show. Oh, um, thank you. I was just wondering in Libya what the percentage of Roman Catholics are and what their lifestyle is like. I'll hang up and listen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I don't know in Libya, it's a but pretty in, tiny population. Very, very tiny. Yeah. But in Morocco, where mm -hmm. we're giving them a large amount of foreign foreign aid, they have expelled a lot of the Christians from the country. Uh, there were a large number in certain, but in, in Libya, I do not know the answer. Well, when you look at a place like Egypt, that we that have been the beneficiary of billions of 50, Americans, over dollars. fifty billion, and yet you have Coptic populations. I've seen, I, you know, I've, I've spent a little time there, and to see these young girls running for cover, afraid they're going to get, you know, snatched or raped or abused, because this is seen as a conversion technique. Yeah, Chris Smith has had some interesting mm -hmm. hearings on, on the conversion. Yeah, they do. They kidnap these. And Young Coptic yes, girls and, exactly. uh, you know, uh, impregnate them essentially right. and then force them to have Muslim children right. and bring them into the fold. It's really barbaric what's happening there and, uh, you know, thank goodness you're raising your voice and others like you. I want to talk about something in the book that, uh, in Prisoner of Conscience, you talk about, I mean, you were, here you are, you get out of law school, you, serve, you were in the army, you go to Congress. How did you get involved? What was it that drew you to these particular issues that you spent so much of your life well, when I got on. elected, I was interested in transportation issues, mm -hmm. and uh, I joined a small small Bible study, Congressman Tony Hall, who's a Democrat, and a group of others, and mm -hmm. a res as a result of that, uh, uh, changes came about. In 1984, Tony called me and asked me to go to Ethiopia. You remember the famine in Ethiopia? Sure. It was a life-changing experience. I got stuck in a camp that was operated by World Vision, and next to World Vision was a camp operated by Mother Teresa. Mm -hmm. The plane could not come back and pick us up. It's in the book. And at that, mm -hmm. seeing what I saw changed things. And then in 85, Congressman Hall and Congressman Chris Smith uh, took me to Romania. And mm -hmm. Romania was darker in kilowatt, and, but in everything, darker and more evil than even Mos Moscow. Many really? people came up and put... Uh, we met with a bishop, Bishop a Bishop Bishop Robo there, and many people would come up, put a little note in her hand saying, "My husband's in jail. My son has been picked picked up." Hmm. Those two trips, seeing the famine, the hunger during the, mid, the Mengitsu government, and then seeing what we saw in in Romania, then Chris Smith and I came back with Tony Hall. We introduced the bill to take away MFN. We passed it in the House. Most favored nations. Most status. favored nations. That. And mm -hmm. Ronald Reagan saw that and he took it away by executive order. Again, Reagan, Reagan cared about these things. But that's what got me interested. Mm -hmm. The trip in 84 because of Congressman Tony Hall mm -hmm. and the trip in 85 mm -hmm. with uh, Tony and Chris. And you've been at it all these, these years, almost 30 years, more than 30 years now. Yeah, more than 30 years. Yeah. Well, let's talk for a moment because we have a lot of international viewers before we go. We have people watching in Ireland, in England, uh, even in Africa. What of the international community? There was a time, we were talking in the break, when you had John Paul II, you had Maggie Thatcher, you had Reagan, you, uh, world leaders all across Europe and the United States concerned about these issues. Do you have that same uh, awareness on the internet in the international community that you once had? No, I, I don't think so. In fact, is um, if you know the story, Shabazz Bhatti was in mm -hmm. the Pakistan government. Uh, he w we were trying to get him an armored car, and they wouldn't give it to him. He was gunned down coming out of his mother's house about four four months ago, there was barely any comment at all around, around the world. No, we do not have, uh, we do not have the great leaders mm -hmm. speaking out on, on those issues. I'm sure they're out there. I don't know mm -hmm. why their voice has been muffled, but no, I, I cannot say that they're out there. Handicap this for me. Do you think your commission on religious international freedom is going to stand, or I, are we going to lose it this year? I think it will, because if this, if this senator, whoever he is, doesn't, uh, how will he explain that? But I, I will keep you informed and let yeah, you know. Please but do. my hope and expectation is that it will. Okay. Our final question, we have a call from Tony. Go ahead, Tony. What's your question? Yes, my question is, are we involved in a Cold War with China, or we're just not admitting it? Are we involved in a Cold War? Uh, we, we ought to be doing everything we can to bring about freedom and democracy in, in that country. I believe the Chinese people are good. When Chris Smith and I went there mm -hmm. last year, 
If you go on an internet cafe and hit Chris Smith, hit Frank Wolf, hit the Dalai Lama, nothing comes up. We have the ability to bypass Facebook. We could change that government. But right now, because, and you've raised the issue, because of the debt that we owe them, we are really not advocating. GE, the President Obama's jobs guy, Jeff Immelt, has created more jobs in China. GE just moved their healthcare facility to China. Hmm. GE just signed an avionics deal with China to do their avionics for the aircraft. The iPads made in China, the iPods made in China, the iPhones made in China. Hmm. So we ought to be, and we should be doing the same thing the Pope John Paul and Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher did. Tear down that wall. And we have the ability, hmm. and my hope is somebody would come along who would be like President Reagan, who would advocate. Reagan said again, the words in the Constitution and the words in the Declaration of Independence were a covenant with the entire world, not just the people in Philadelphia mm -hmm. in 76 or 1787, mm -hmm. but with the entire world. You know, and also I think one other thing, and I'll end with this, sure. the power of prayer. I was at an event in 1990, it's in the book, and a lady mm -hmm. said, why do I think the, the Berlin Wall fell down and communism failed? And I said, well, Ronald Reagan put in the cruise missiles and Ronald Reagan did this. She said, no, that may have helped. She had a broken accent. She said, millions have been praying for the defeat of communism. And I said, oh my goodness, my mom and dad taught me to pray for the defeat of communism. And I think she's right. I pray, I know this could be controversial. I pray every night that the current regime, government in mm -hmm. China will collapse peacefully, mm -hmm. peacefully, and that they will collapse. And I think in my lifetime, and I'm 72, Mm -hmm. I think we may see the demise of this Chinese government. And then the church can worship and everyone will have the freedom and then we can be together. But mm -hmm. as of now, we're not standing up to the Chinese. Mm -hmm. Very good. Congressman Frank Wolf, thank you for being here. And for the book, Prisoner of Conscience, One Man's Crusade for Global Human and Religious Rights. It's available at bookstores everywhere and online. It's a fascinating read, particularly in this whole issue. And you're, you're, I mean, you're really like a, a living encyclopedia of, of human freedom, religious freedom, and, and uh, you've, you've seen it all. And it's really quite something. Thank you for the book. When we return, we'll talk about faith-inspired fiction with novelist, Professor of Literature and Deacon Ron Hansen. The World Over Live continues in a moment. Stay right there. Now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Okay, in the interest of full disclosure, my next guest is one of my favorite novelists. He's an arts and humanities professor at Santa Clara University in California. He's written some unforgettable books, including Mariette in Ecstasy, Atticus, The Assassination of Jesse James by the Coward, Robert Ford, and many more. One of his recent efforts, Exiles, is the story of poet Gerard Manley Hopkins juxtaposed with the 1875 shipwreck of the Deutschland, which in Deutschland, which inspired a famous Hopkins poem. And his most recent novel, A Wild Surge of Guilty Passion, deals with temptation, desire, and murder, based on true events from the 1920s. How does his faith shape these diverse works, and they're very diverse? Please welcome back to the program, Ron Hansen. Thank so you. good to have you back, Ron. Great to be here. Let, let's talk about this. First of all, how do you, I mean, you get this all the time. How do you select this what draws you first to a story or a particular genre or time period? Right. I, I come across the information either re reading a biography or a history or something like that, or maybe sometimes it's just a story I've heard in, in my yeah. ears. And for some reason, I can't shake it. And if I, it stays with me a long enough time, I think I finally have to write it and get rid of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, Hopkins was like that. I discovered his poetry when I was in college and really loved it a lot. And I only discovered his poetry because it wasn't much discussed then. Uh -huh. Because I read Dylan Thomas was a big... In, in, Who referenced him in, in yeah, one of his books. And he was very influenced by Hopkins. So mm -hmm. I m fell in love with his poetry, read his biography, and I thought his was one of the most tragic and yet hopeful lies I'd ever mm -hmm. read about because he was totally neglected in his own time period. Mm -hmm. 
but like all obscure writers, he had hopes that someday yeah. somebody would discover him, and indeed they did. And Hopkins was a, was a Jesuit, uh, a kind of unhappy fellow, yeah. not the happiest, cheeriest of people. Manic depressive, probably. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. wrote these poems that he destroyed many of them. I mean, it was a friend of his who sort of Kept right. the kept the yeah the, he was he, he was very casual about the keeping of his poems and luckily um, mm -hmm. his friend Robert Bridges did yeah. keep them and pasted them all into an album mm. and that's why we have them now isn't that amazing yeah. tell me what drew you though to explore that poem the wreck of the Deutschland that 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 famous shipwreck yeah. uh, there were five nuns referenced in right. the poem you spend an enormous amount of time on these five nuns right. why those five nuns and why juxtapose them with Hopkins. I was I was dealing with the concept of um, well of people who think why am I being killed why am I dying mm. doesn't God care about me mm. or and how other people treat that mal that terrible thing that happens to them and I was I wanted to create these biographies of these women mm. because so little is really known about right. them. Hopkins writes a whole poem about them and he doesn't know their names. Mm. Um, because he and, was going off of a newspaper report which right. is referenced in the book. Yeah. yeah. And what struck me was that their story was basically Hopkins' story as well. That they are, they're leaving, they're being kicked out of Germany because Bismarck hates the Catholics and wants to get rid of the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. And they're heading toward Missouri where they're going to be working in a hospital. And then they suddenly they're drowning on this, in this mm -hmm. shipwreck. And they're thinking, why is God doing this to me? You know, I had so much to give, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's the kind of feeling a lot of people have when they find they have cancer yeah. or something like yeah. that. And yeah. I think Hopkins must have felt the same way. He was a successful he, student at Oxford mm -hmm. and he had all kinds of grand ambitions. Yeah. And then he got one lousy assignment after the other mm. and had this manic depressive problem. And then finally he dies of typhoid. Yeah. And he had that feeling of exile as well from his totally. family, from Oxford. Yeah. I mean, even from the Jesuits a bit. Yeah. I mean, he feels... Yeah, in oh. Oxford, you weren't allowed to go on for an advanced degree if you were a Catholic. Mm. And he was called the star of Balliol College, and so he had all kinds of expectations of being very successful there mm. and successful in his life. And then his family, mm. when he converted to Catholicism, thought of him as a pervert. And mm. uh, they, wouldn't, they never attended any of his masses, never saw him at all until mm. he was on his deathbed. Yeah, I was going to ask you, at the end of the book, at the end of Exiles, which is a beautiful lyrical uh, uh, book and it gets into the lives of these Franciscan sisters. Yeah. Um, beautiful. I mean, the, and the personalities emerge. You see the character uh, uh, dysfunction as well as the, the really grand joys of these people. And when faced with imminent death, it's, I mean, I don't want to ruin it for people, yeah. but you, you really see the measure of these, these women. And, uh, you know, they, they aren't all uh, ideal heroes, no. but the faith shines through them yes. in different ways. Hopkins was drawn to writing the poem because mm -hmm. of a tall nun who shouted out, Oh, Christ, come quickly. Mm -hmm. And I think that really meant something to him and resonated with his own ambitions in religious mm -hmm. life. And uh, I, uh, part of the reason I wrote the book was to try and get her at that woman and all the other women around her mm -hmm. and what they felt, felt about Christ and how that resonated. But there wasn't Hopkins. a lot out there. I mean, you're, you're, you're kind of no, picking I and, and, and I mean, you've got little scraps of right. their names, you know, the convent they came yeah. from. How much else did you know about them? Almost nothing. Uh -huh. But what I did was I looked at uh, founders of religious orders, uh, mm -hmm. foundresses, I guess, mm -hmm. of religious orders and looked at their, read their biographies. And so I took details from all those women mm -hmm. and put kind them in Kind of weaved there. it all together. Yeah. Yeah, it's fascinating. It's a beautiful book. Uh, if you'd like to comment or you have a question, uh, give us a ring. 1-800-221-9460 in the U.S. and internationally. 205-271-2980 or drop us an email, worldover at EWTN.com. We're talking to author Ron Hansen. And look, this is a treat for you. You don't even have to go to Santa Clara and pay that high price. He's right here. <laughs> Free advice for you aspiring writers or avid readers. Um, I want to talk for a moment about the amount of research you do. Uh, reading both of these books, and I, I recently reread them for, for this interview, mm -hmm. um, the excruciating attention to detail. Yeah. In the newest book, in, in uh, a, a Wild Surge of Guilty Passion, you, you make passing reference to uh, radios hadn't been put in cars yet. Right. And so she was sitting in the car entertaining herself by, you know, fixing her nails or right. doing something else. Um, those little tidbits I found so fascinating that sort of suck you into that time and place. 
How long does it take you to do that research? A couple of years, mm -hmm. but I, I do research while I'm writing too. I read oh, every newspaper, uh, every issue of the New York Daily Mirror during the period I was writing about. So oh, it was like I was living in Queens, New York myself. Mm. And, Let, and let's talk about this new book because this is, the, uh, admittedly, and I want to be very clear up front because I don't want to get your letters. Uh, <laughs> this is this is an adult work, right. and it's very it's a very mature content. Right. Uh, we're talking about, many of you may be familiar with the, the, the movie Double Indemnity. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, and tell us how you came, this is kind of the true story that that film and the novel were based upon. Yeah. How did you come to this? I was teaching Double Indemnity and I was doing uh, my due research uh, uh -huh. to teach my students and I came across this biography of James M. Cain uh -huh. and there was a little footnote that said this was of course based on the Snyder Gray case. And I'd never uh -huh. heard of that but through the magic of Google I <laughs> typed in Snyder Gray and then a lot of the information came up. And what intrigued me was that um, James M. Cain has the guy decide to murder the husband within about 20 pages. Right. And for me the really interesting part was how does a guy go from being an absolutely normal mm -hmm. Christian to being a guy who murders right. a woman's um, husband. husband. And so the, a lot, that was the interesting part and that was almost nothing was written about that so I could invent more. Uh -huh. I had the court transcript of the trial and so they were mm -hmm. referring back to their first meetings and so mm -hmm. forth so I had that to go on. But and they I, both wrote their odd accounts of right. this so in, when they yeah. were in Sing Sing exactly. separately. Yeah. Separate but equal in right. Sing Sing. Um, and, and it's really the story of uh, Ruth Snyder and Judd Gray and their uh, affair. Mm -hmm. And you do a fantastic job of painting the family life of both of these people. Mm -hmm. And what I love about all of your work, not just this, it is not on the nose. Right. Catholicism. It yeah. isn't preachy. However, that said, and I've always said this about your work. In between the lines, almost imperceptibly, there is this shadow, there is this haunting yeah. of the faith, this pulsing thing that lives and pushes. Mm -hmm. And in the case of Judd, as he falls deeper and deeper into this relationship with this woman, you see him pulling back and exactly. the conscience going off. How, how do you balance that? How do you strike it? How do you, do, do, is most of that done in revision? Do you do it up front? No, it's already there. You know, uh -huh. part of what attracted me to the topic to begin with uh -huh. was, as I said, the kind of moral decisions mm -hmm. or each lack step of moral of the way. decisions yeah. each step of the way. And um, how it is kind of progressive. Once he cheats on his wife, mm -hmm. he then thinks of himself capable of anything. Mm -hmm. And then he gets more and more alcoholic as time goes on. The death uh, spiral. He yeah. calls it a death spiral. Exactly. And one of the reviewers of this book said it's almost a tour of the seven deadly sins. <laughs> right, exactly. And it, it really is. It is yeah. I mean, it really is. Yeah. But I, what I love about it is it starts, it's so mundane. Right. They kind of meet in a, it's a coworker introduces this guy uh, in a New York uh, eatery. and. Yeah. It all begins there. Right. The mundanity of, the, of, yeah. of sin itself. Right. He was a man who was accustomed to meeting lots of women because he was a corset salesman. Mm -hmm. So he's very charming mm -hmm. and somewhat good looking and he was making good money for that time period. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was a vamp to a certain degree, you know, yeah. a beautiful Swedish blonde. Yeah. And uh, she, she loved men in, in general, but I think she was probably looking for one kind of man who could she, she could manipulate mm -hmm. with the intent that he would yeah. eventually knock yeah. off on her husband, which yeah. he and did. Then the, and the, and they, they so bungle this case. Yeah. I mean, Damon it's Runyon. It's comical. What, what did yeah. Damon Runyon call the it? The dumbbell murder. The dumbbell murder, yeah, because yeah, it was just so outrageous the way she, she yeah. wrapped her you know, legs in, in, uh, with a, a clothesline right. and then sent the daughter out to get a neighbor and yeah. but don't yell, don't get anyone else, right. just go get the neighbor. Yeah. I mean, it was just, it's a ridiculous story. I want to read at the end of this, okay. the end of the book, and I hope I'm not ruining anything. That's all right. Both of them get the, death, get the chair for this, yeah. the electric chair. Um, and it says... As the doctors readied their trays and instruments, because they had to do an autopsy, there Ruth and Judd lay, naked and side by side again, their arms hanging from the gurneys so that their hands almost touched, calm now, silent, dispassionate, loved. Right. Explain that line. <laughs> uh, well, you understand the dispassionate yeah. part. Yeah. Uh, but I thought that what they were really seeking was love. Mm -hmm. All along, mm -hmm. and that and they inappropriately went about finding it. Yeah. yeah, and had they recognized the love of God, that they wouldn't have gotten into this mess. Mm -hmm. And I thought 
that they'd all they come to peace basically uh, in their deaths. But mm -hmm. uh, before that, both of them yeah. became religious. Yeah, both of them found yeah. religion. She yeah. converted to Catholicism, right. Ruth apparently yeah. in jail in the twenties. And he he became a much more staunch and pious uh, individual. And so, really, what I was trying to say was that despite the fact that we might dislike these characters, these are people loved by God, mm -hmm. and that's why it loved is the last word there because oh. they would have achieved that in their mm -hmm. death, found what God was telling them all along. Why pursue material and spend two years yeah. on material that has been so done? Right. Uh, the, the double indemnity, uh, oh, they've done a string of movies on this. Yeah. They've done uh, documentaries, uh, nonfiction, Postman Always mm -hmm. Rings Twice. This has been done to death, Ron. Right. What did you bring to it, do you think, that hadn't well, been explored before? Well, I think it's before? that, the, the Christian message uh -huh. under, underneath it. And to, as the, somebody says, you tour the de seven deadly sins, right. but you come at the other end realize, realizing that this is the wrong thing. Yeah. It's, in some ways, it works like an AA meeting where a person comes up and confesses all their faults yeah. and then says, then I got sober and life is much better. Yeah. And the same thing, I think, happens there in this yeah. way. Well, There's one... an enforced sobriety for Judd. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. uh, both of them came to understand exactly how wrong they were. Mm -hmm. you, you know, in one of your books, uh, your earlier books, you wrote, a faith-inspired fiction squarely faces the improbables of life. Right. What improbables <laughs> do you well, face both in both of these books, in, in Exiles as well as in uh, Wild Surge? Of well, I, uh, and I think I meant improbables as um, the virgin birth, ah. um, supernatural things, okay. uh, grace, you know, ah, all those okay. things. And I thought that fiction should actually address those issues that all of us are familiar, or most mm -hmm. of us are familiar mm -hmm. with, mm -hmm. you know, the power of prayer. Yeah. Um, and the feelings that we have when we pray for others, that God is rewarding us in some way. What I have always loved about your work is you could very easily today be the Louis L'Amour of, of <laughs> uh, literary fiction and historical fiction yeah. because Desperados and the assassination of Jesse James were such well-drawn, powerful narratives. They too have this same pulsing sense of grace beneath them, mm -hmm. around them, in them, of them. Why do you swing so wildly from one genre, one yeah. time to another? And are you worried, just from a, as a writer, that your audience isn't, they, you know, look, they like to know, oh, he's the romance right. writer. Yeah. He's the mystery writer. Right. He's the religious writer. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not a brand name, mm. and it's because of that. Your brand name in my house. Oh, thank I, you. And let me tell you, not only in my house, the, some of the best writers in the world, from James Lee Burke. In fact, we did our 15th anniversary oh, special. Oh, that's great. And the intro to you was, Ron Hansen's one of the greatest writers. <laughs> it's like Babe Ruth in the World Series, <laughs> this guy. And, you know, and then we he's went to you. He's a great guy. Oh, he's fantastic. Yeah. And, a, and a beautiful, yeah. lyrical writer. I love his, his no. books, yeah. No. But, well, you all have said that, that sensibility is the same, that right. sense of grace beneath all of the ugliness and horror right. of the world. It's yeah. there. It's still there. Um, tell me also how, what's next? What are you working on next? I have a book of short stories that's coming out next summer. Ah. And uh, it's pretty all much new? Conclude. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, they might add some from a previous collection. A few from collection. Nebraska? Yeah. So, so uh -huh. it might be new and selected or something like that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, and, and I think it's going to be good. Why do you think, I, I sometimes get emails, we have, we have a lot of emails coming in now and calls, and we'll get to them, okay. I promise. I'm going to ask only one more question, and then I'll let you talk. Um, I, I see emails, and I get friends will come to me, and they're very well-read people. I mean, these are very educated people. And they say, you know, I, I just don't do fiction. Right. Yeah. Why not? Why do you think people have this, there are some people that have an aversion to fiction. They think they're wasting their time. Mm -hmm. that, um, they're, they're, if there are not a lot of facts in there. In fact, that's why I think this book would probably be appealing to them because yeah. you are learning something on right. the way. No, there's a lot of facts here. in here that, yeah. uh, and then you, you almost don't know where the embroidery ends and where the fact begins. It, it yeah. sent me kind of on a hunt and peck mission looking <laughs> yeah. for, did this happen? What? How much? Yeah. Where did he get this from? Right. So it, it, it does make yeah. it, I think it's a fascinating ride for people. Yeah. But there's something, you can also f do something in fiction that you can't do anywhere else. Sure. And yeah. what is that? Well, you can tell the truth about life and without all the facts getting in the way. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, it's a, a person experiences uh, somebody else's life in fiction. They're standing in the shoes of Judd Gray or mm -hmm. you know, wearing the dress of, Judd, of uh, Ruth Snyder. Yeah. Um, 
And you can't do that. And, and there are a lot of, as you said, a lot of histories, a lot of biographies about mm -hmm. this case, but very few attempts at actually getting inside the lives of these people. Mm -hmm. And you know, you, ideally, when you write a scene about a snowstorm, somebody should feel cold when they're reading it. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what mm -hmm. fiction does, and you don't feel that way when you're reading nonfiction. Yeah, I agree. Uh, this is an email from Susan, and she writes, um, there's a slippery slope in the world today that encourages writers who are Catholic to check their values at the door. In other words, if you aren't embracing the secularism of the moment, you may never see your work published in a venue and make a living. Do you have any recommendations for Catholic writers who work in the secular press or writing and want to make a living? Right. You know, when I was first writing Mariette and Ecstasy, I asked an editor if he would publish a book about a nun. He said, no. And I said, oh, well, that's what I'm working on. He says, oh, well, if you're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> and so I did get it published. But there is that, uh, you know, what she says is real. There's a, mm -hmm. a, a way of being put off by that subject. But if the, if the work is good enough, I think mm -hmm. they're, they're receptive to it because they think of it as kind of an an exotic, yeah, mm -hmm. exotic territory. Mm -hmm. Something exotic. Flannery O'Connor used to talk about that, about that, you know, the obligation, what was it, the obligation of the Catholic, you can't be just good enough. You have to be better than. You have to right. be superior yeah. because of those obstacles that you talk about. Yeah. But when you, when you see examples of it, uh, and, and it, and it's really working, there's nothing like it. There's right. just a depth to it that makes exactly. it. Exactly. It's like you know, truth. You're, you're writing in a chromatic scale rather than black and white, because uh -huh. you're aware of God and uh, the sacraments. You and don't all find it things. limiting. As no, some not people at all. would say, oh, it's limiting, and you're a deacon. That's <laughs> yeah. got to limit. That's got to put shackles that on is, you when you go to the page. I know. People do worry about that. And obviously, this book is not yes, written Yes, this by... book would disprove that, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. No, but, it, but I, I would argue that, pro I would bet that, well, I'm going to ask you, and then I'll give you my yeah. impression. How has it changed your writing, being an ordained deacon? How long have you been a deacon? Three years, four years? Five years. Five years now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it hasn't, really. Mm -hmm. I think one thing you're aware of is the peak moments in people's lives, because that's your participating. You're, along with you're doing with the funerals, w weddings, baptisms, and mm -hmm. all those things. And you see what's, what is real about people. And mm -hmm. I'm, I work as a spiritual director sometimes. And so you uh. r realize what's gnawing at people, what mm -hmm. happens mm -hmm. in their lives. Mm -hmm. and it, makes you be more realistic about what's going on in the world, I think. Mm -hmm. No, it's, it's, it's real world. I mean, two I, of my friends are nuns, and they're fighting over the book. They couldn't put it down. <laughs> I thought that was great. I told that to my publicist. She thought it was wonderful that nuns are fighting over this book. <laughs> Let's go to Marie from Montana. Go ahead, Marie. What's your question? Oh, my goodness gracious. It's really a comment. Okay. I work here at the public library in Great Falls, Montana. Okay. And I, I happened, I know now it was providential. I found the book on the shelf. Which book? His Exiles. Okay. okay. The Exiles, Ron Hansen. Oh, yeah. And I could not put it down. It's the best book I've ever read in my entire oh, thank life. You. And I've read a lot. But anyway, I had heard a homily by one of our priests, and he had mentioned Gerard Manley Hopkins. And of course, I do have a prayer book with some of his. Uh -huh. And I was fascinated by the book. And just yesterday, oh. I, I uh, recommend it to a really good friend of mine from the military base. She's a good Catholic lady. Okay. And I, I, I can't say enough about the book. It's powerful in, in so many ways. They mm -hmm. should make a movie of it. It'd be better mm -hmm. than the Titanic. Ah, I, I like that too. You, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Marie. Well, there you see, right? many people. And, you know, it's the, the I, I think what Marie is getting at, she almost said it there. You carry, it's not only, you don't only go through and enjoy the ride and the characters and the nuance and the detail. When it's over, it's like you carry this with you. Well, I it's, hope so, you, you, take a, you take the atmosphere, the thoughts, you stick with it, it stays with you. Right. There's so few, let's be honest. <laughs> How many books do you read that really stay and linger with you? Not very many. Uh -huh. Who sadly. do you read? Uh, a good friend of mine is uh, Jim Shepard. I mm -hmm. read all of his fiction. Mm -hmm. He's a wonderful writer. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, he's one of the first readers of all my stuff and oh, really? gives me advice. And I re do the same thing for him. Uh -huh. And my wife, Bo Caldwell, oh, she's sure. uh, written a couple of novels. One is uh, The Distant Light of My Father. Yep. And then City of Tranquil Light. They're both available in paperback that now. So. <laughs> See that getting all the yeah. plugs in? That's I like right. that. <laughs> That's like an author's got to do what an author's got to yeah. do. Um, let's talk a little bit about how. The teaching, how do you teach, can you teach your approach to writing? You can teach somebody to improve their writing. Mm 
-hmm. They have to come up with the ideas themselves, and then you say, you know, I think you went a little off track here. Mm -hmm. Maybe you should build up this scene or burnish this prose a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's little things like that. But I'm getting at something else. When I was studying acting with Stella Adler, she used to say, I want you all to go follow a priest, a rabbi, or a minister around for a week. And that was part of our, it was one of our sure. assignments. And we said, well, why are we doing this? And she'd say, I want to expand your souls. Oh. And we would have to come in with a religious text. And for weeks, we did religious texts Wonderful. of various types. And her attempt was to deepen what, what you were bringing to the game and, and, and elevate the importance of what this was about. How do you communicate that, or do you attempt to? Yeah, to I don't think that. It has to be within uh -huh. a writer mm -hmm. more than an actor, probably, because mm -hmm. an actor is a persona, after yeah, all. Yeah. Uh, well, I would argue this is a persona, too. You're, well, true. You're walking. You're, I mean, yeah. uh, look, I, I've Granted. attempted this. This is, <laughs> this is a high wire act, and it's as good as any performance on a stage, let me tell you, and a lot better considering what I've seen on some stages. Go ahead, Mari from Arizona. What's your question? Yes, I was wondering if um, he had... Uh, your guest had read any Chesterton and what kind of oh, sure. influence mm -hmm. that bad because you know Chesterton was a novel he wrote fiction he wrote about mm -hmm. faith and I was just curious I'll I'll hang the, up and it, thank you I'll, it's a enjoyable show. I read okay, the, uh, Heterodoxy and Orthodoxy yeah. and the Father Brown stories. Oh, yeah. um, They're great tales, yeah. the Father Brown mysteries. His biography fun. of Thomas Aquinas. I read quite a bit of Chesterton. Yeah. He's wonderful. Yeah, no, he's really, he was a really. A real master of the English language. Yeah, and a man of his time. He was, you know, involved in controversies and writing right. fiction, re creating a genre. I mean, he really created exactly. mysteries. Yeah. I mean, the, the way we know them now, anyway, right. is fascinating. Where do you go, where do you go for inspiration? when you're looking for ideas or when you're stuck. We all get stuck right. in the middle of a project. Where I, do you go? What do you do? When I'm stuck, I just read my favorite writers and just mm. try and imitate them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I go to my library and think, what kind of scene do I want to do? And then I think of all the books there, uh -huh. which ones have scenes like that? Mm -hmm. So a lot of writing is imitation. They or, teach you. And, yeah. And they teach you. And the mass, I know, is a daily routine in yes. your life. Yeah. And that, I, I, and I, things have come out of homilies where I've been stuck. I've heard a line or something. I said, I that's exactly what I needed. Uh -huh. And then yeah. you go and put it in. I put it in there. Yeah. yeah. One of the things I love in the in the newest book is you see, you feel that tug. He, you know, this this poor guy. He wanders way, way off the path. Yeah. And he finds himself in church, and they're singing the hymns, and they're almost like a little scourges to him and then right. they preach on you know yeah. the things what is it the things that come out of a man uh, uh, <laughs> right. you know, the things that <laughs> destroy him adultery fornication yeah. lies exactly. murder and you know it's like a preview of guilty everything. as charged yeah, <laughs> everything we're, we're about to see from this poor soul but uh so next you're doing the short stories book of stories then i don't know what i'm going to do after that uh-huh you're going to be um, coy with me then yes okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll let you go the books are fantastic. I can't recommend them enough. Uh, if you haven't read Ron Hansen, you should start at the beginning and work your way clear through. A Wild Surge of Guilty Passion and Exiles are both available at bookstores everywhere and the usual online outlets. I'm going to remind you again, the subject matter of Wild Surge is for mature <laughs> adult readers. You've been warned. Thank you, Ron. Thank it's you, Ron. Fantastic Raymond. having you here. And Exiles, if you have any interest in Gerard uh, Manley Hopkins, it is a, I didn't know, I knew almost nothing about him. Well, that's I best. knew the work. And this really, no, it really opened up, it really opens up the work and, and uh, an important Catholic literary figure and Catholic figure, period. So go read it. Before we go, Thank remember you. the Truth in Life audio Bible is still available through the EWTN Religious Catalog. It's the only Catholic dramatized audio Bible available anywhere. Stacy Keach, Michael York, John Reese Davies, Julia Ormond, and many others bring the Gospels to life as never before. Go to RaymondArroyo.com. I've got a link to the catalog up top there. And as long as you're there, visit our Facebook and Twitter pages. They're linked through on the left. I'll send you a couple of articles about Ron's uh, work and some reviews, even a little preview uh, of, uh, of one of the chapters. Also, some great Catholic film recommendations for the weekend. The Emilio Estevez movie, The Way, opened nationwide this weekend. 
go see it. It's a powerful movie, particularly for those of you dealing with loss or a big change in your life or loss of a loved one. It's, uh, it's an important film. And a new movie, The Mighty Max. It's a kind of fun family uh, film. It tells the story of Immaculata College's women's basketball team and their unlikely road to national preeminence. The movie stars Ellen Burstyn as a feisty mother superior. Archbishop Charles Shapiro of Philadelphia saw it the other night. He said it's a story of faith and determination, and it's inspirational. The Mighty Max is also on screens everywhere this weekend. Check those films out until next week. We'll be scouting the world over for all that is seen and unseen. On behalf of the staff and crew of EWTN News, I'm Raymond Arroyo. We'll see you next time. Bye now.